Uh, yeah, I'm going to do my second talk of the day um, uh, and annoy you with kind of the continuation with what I uh, talked about earlier um, today. Um, so Linux and TPMs. Um, yeah, I hope the overlap is not going to be uh, um, too big. If you have any specific questions, again, do interrupt me. I like very much uh, um, if we can uh, uh, get the discussion into the direction that you want rather than me um, just uh, uh, read what I have on my slides here. Um, anyway, so um, let's jump right in. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the work in, in, in uh, adding TPM support to SystemD and um, my goal of actually making this a thing on across the across the Linux ecosystem and making this a thing that uh, hopefully all the Linux distributions can sooner or later just adopt and uh, yeah so my goals are I want to catch up with other OSs um, like most other OSs like if you look at Android if you look at Apple devices and Windows since 10 years or something um, have been using TPMs heavily have had measured boot um, have used disk encryption locked to these uh, um, TPMs or equivalent Secchi elements um, generic Linux just didn't right like um, Chrome OS had but um, like if you install one of the classic Linux distributions and none of them use any of this. Um, the TPM stuff basically doesn't really exist outside of uh, um, the uh, um, like commercial OSs. Um, so my goal with this is, yeah, I want this uh, to change. I think that the functionality offered by Metroid Boot is great. And uh, um, we should make it a thing that everybody can just use um, and thus build a world that is more secure and uh, less vulnerable to uh, uh, um, hackers and, and things like that. So. Um, uh, yeah, one of the primary goals of the TPM stuff is always disk encryption, meaning that, uh, yeah, you can store or associate a, a secret that unlocks your disk in the TPM, and then the TPM can enforce policies on how it allows access to that key. Um, and, uh, yeah, the interesting part is, like, uh, specifically how these policies are designed. Um, I talked about this earlier, um, about the PCR concept um, uh, that we have on Linux and measurements and things like that. So, uh, um, yeah, this kind of stuff. But we want to use it for more than disk encryption. I also want to use it for service credentials. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I think some talks even mentioned this earlier. The concept of service credentials in SystemD is something like how you can securely parameterize uh, services with things like like uh, SSL certificates, private keys, uh, passwords, or actually any kind of configuration too, if that's what you want. But the primary goal is having something that it can be um, encrypted, can be um, authenticated, um, and can be passed into services um, uh, in, a, in a reasonably safe uh, way, and then it's available for the services to read. Um, I wanted this to be linked to TPM as well, so that these secrets can only be unlocked on a specific system, so that you can feel reasonably safe that if you put a secret on some system, that um, it's only that system uh, and in the right state can decode this. Um, pretty closely related to this is also secure parameterization of the boot process, um, because uh, yeah, um, in the general case, uh, booting a system means that you have to parameterize it somehow. Like it could be something simple as like you boot from the network and you want to specify the server, and then uh, you want to pin this certificate um, inside of that thing. So um, these parameters somehow need to get onto that system and be authenticated. And uh, I think this should be bound to the TPM because that's kind of the only thing how we can do this securely. Um, Another goal with this is um, confidential computing. Confidential computing, nobody knows what precisely it actually really is, and in particular what it's going to be in five years. But uh, there are certainly um, some things where uh, um, we probably should be ready um, so that if confidential computing actually turns out to be a thing, um, uh, uh, we behave in a way that you can tie the disk encryption again and the state of the of the confidential VM to uh, um, yeah against each other. Um, also, one of the goals with what I'm talking about here is really that other components can also do TPMs uh, to stuff, meaning that a policy that locks um, secrets to the uh, to the system state and to the OS is not something that uh, is in exclusive, uh, that should be exclusive to disk encryption to the credentials management. I think probably all components of the system might um, include, want to include access policies to TPM bound secrets um, uh, related to that. Um, so uh, yeah, the goal is a 
certainly to democratize uh, these kind of things and not to own them so that everyone can participate in, in this and make use of this. Um, yeah, and the uh, overarching goal, of course, is I want this good enough that this can be the default. I mean, I have no illusions it will take ages until, like, in particularly the slower moving distributions will adopt this, but um, at least we want it to be so, so good that, um, like, the faster moving ones, let's say Fedora, could turn this on by default, and it will not uh, 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 break everything. This is, a, this is, of course, a difficult goal, right? Like, it's certainly one achievable because Windows does this, right? Like, on regular consumer PCs, Windows does all the measured TPM stuff and things like that. So it's certainly not out of reach for us to do the same, but it's um, yeah, still not easy because um, unless we do exactly the same thing as Windows does, um, uh, there's a good chance we'll run into hardware bugs and, and, and things like that. Um, yeah. So, like first, I would like to talk a little bit about the current state of all of this, um, specifically in systemd, but um, also in some other components. Um, uh, what we have in this area. But uh, before we do this, any questions at this point? No question at this point. Okay, then let's jump right in. So the first component I'd like to talk about is systemd crypt setup. Um, crypt setup without the systemd prefix is, of course, um, has been a Linux component since forever, um, and it's how you set up disk encryption, like how you format a, a, a lux disk, basically. Systemd crypt setup is just that, but um, it integrates um, the disk encryption with various areas. It can ask for passwords, can do TPM, FIDO2, PKCS11, and a couple of other things. Um, yeah, and t the, I want to talk about the TPM support. Um, with system crypt setup, you can bind your blocks volumes to TPM2. Um, there are three kinds of policies. Like one is about literal PCR values. I'm, do I need to repeat what PCRs are, are? I hope that everybody here was in the earlier talk, so I'm not going to do that. That's good. That saves some time. So the policies. Um, how this, the 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 uh, secret to unlock the disk is released from the TPM. Um, like the primary policy is against PCR values, literal ones, or the signature of PCR values. Um, uh, this is like what I'm actually advertising what people use because it's uh, less um, uh, um, prone to like this brittleness problems with PCRs because it basically allows us to lock our disk against a signature. I talked about this in the earlier talk uh, a lot actually. So this is actually I think way more interesting than the literal PCR uh, stuff. There is a policy available that you also combine that with a pin, um, and the pin checking is also enforced by the TPM. Um, yeah, um, system scripts that up cannot just use the TPM stuff for unlocking, but it can also measure what it has unlocked uh, specifically, um, and this is enabled on your folder of UKIs for the root file system. Um, then it will measure a, something that it derives from the volume key into PCR for 15 once and unlock. Why do we do this? Um, this, I think, is quite a powerful concept because, in a way, the volume key of the root file system is a little bit like an identifier for the system, right? Like it's a, it's a key that hopefully was generated locally only on that machine, never leaves the machine. Um, and hence, if we derive some ID from that um, and uh, measure it into PCR, we can do uh, fun things like, for example, we can prove per disk image that is encrypted and comes with a TPM PCR policy against PCR 15. And that basically then means it can be unlocked only on that specific machine um, uh, and nobody by, by nothing else. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's also the, next, the other side of the equation is system decrypt and roll. Uh, crypt setup sets up the volume system, uh, decrypt and roll and rolls um, the things. Uh, yeah, it's kind of the other side. There's not much to talk about because it's just how you set things up and everything that system decrypt setup can set up, system decrypt and roll can unroll. Um, next thing I would like to talk about is systemd PCR phase, a relatively recent edition. What this is about is um, most of the PCR measurements uh, um, that you that happen on your system are usually boot stuff, right? Like where every component of the boot um, measures the next boot. Systemd PCR phase then continues this in user space. Uh, it's a tiny tool. All it does is that it's invoked at certain parts of the boot process and measures another string into PCR 11. So the purpose of this basically is that we can distinguish the phase of the boot. These four strings are, did I put it in? Yeah, enter init rd, leave init rd, sys init ready, and shutdown and final. Um, why is this interesting? This is basically interesting so that I can write, um, like put together TPM policies, 
to secure objects that uh, um, are locked to a certain uh, phase or, or a set of certain phases of the boot processes, uh, of the boot process. So basically I can say the root file system, um, I can uh, unlock it only during boot, right, and not afterwards. Um, this is this is a really nice uh, security property because it basically means uh, yeah if somebody exploits um, your system, I mean they might still get the volume key uh, from the from the from the kernel, but at least they cannot ever get it from the TPM again until there's a reset and they get back into this uh, um, boot phase. It's uh, some people call this capping of PCRs, um, uh, but this is more generic because it's not just a one-time cap of the PCRs. It's like it, it, it allows you to communicate clearly um, the state the system is currently in, and then you can use that for any kind of policy you want. Um, yeah, I already mentioned that it uh, binds unlocking to certain specific phases of the boot processes. Um, so that, yeah, once you, for example, transition from the energy to the host, yeah, all the keys are inaccessible. Uh, next thing is system PCR machine. Um, it's another component. Actually, it's implemented in the same C file um, as system PCR phase because it does something equally trivial. All it does, it uh, um, uh, measures at C machine ID um, uh, into PCR 15. So uh, the at C machine ID, for those who don't know, is like, um, it's supposed to be an identifier for the system. It's written on first boot um, and supposed to be dif different, like as a UUID ultimately, um, that is uh, different for each system. And uh, lots of software derives um, uh, things from that and recognize the system as that. Um, so we measure that too. That uh, basically means that I already mentioned that we measure the root FS volume key um, and this too. This together basically makes up the identity um, then of the system. Um, so if you change either of those, uh, the PCR measurements will will uh, change, and hence the identity of the system in a way changes. Quick question. Uh, it is very common on cloud for customers to want to build, put together a virtual machine and then clone it. Have we found any way to solve the machine ID problem in that case? Uh, so um, there's a certain company called AWS, you might know them, and there are certain people who started projects there, um, including your colleague Alex, and uh, there's this concept of uh, generation ID that we uh, all agreed on, and uh, uh, people started like implementing this, and then this was derailed on LKML, but ask your friend Alex. So from our side, everything's good. Um, we know what we want to do, but uh, we need to hook it into something that if you have the uh, generation, um, the VM gen ID thingy, uh, that we can actually get that from user space, um, ideally race freely, um, and then can derive an ID. And then basically the idea would be that it's a machine ID plus the generation. Um, but I, I don't know exactly what that actually means for the TPM case then. Should we measure that and then PCR 15 gets different? It's like certain things about um, uh, generations of systems, uh, like in the clone case or as we talked in the earlier case about the software boot case, are not clear to me what the effects on TPMs are. Um, like how, how do TPMs progress? Should they change? Should they stay the same? Like, yeah. Anyway. So would it also probably make sense to include the endorsement uh, certificate uh, hash copy, something like that, so you can also like bind the TPM and maybe other hardware components to the machine ID, to say this is a uh, unique machine? There are certainly things that, that, that make sense to measure, um, but I mean, my assumption would always be that if you, like, the, the, the binding to the specific TPM is kind of implicit usually if you generate the key on the TPM and it gets derived from the C. So um, if we manage, like, do that, I don't know, there's certainly, like, with all these keys, like, even, we we'll probably need more infrastructure during boot that we can authenticate a TPM um, from our side, and maybe when we do that, we probably also want to measure that. But it's kind of like it's you get some data from the from the TPM and they give it back to the TPM to measure it. It's kind of pointless exercise in a way. You just open it up to being changed on the wire or something like that. I don't know. I, I long story short, I don't understand the implications of this. Um, uh, um, so I'm not opposed. Um, but it certainly makes sense to measure more stuff into that uh, PCR 15. 
Um, but basically, I'm, I, I want PCR15 to be understood as this is the identity of the system, and um, anything that is kind of unique to the system, and uh, where if any of these components are changed, it should be considered a different system, probably makes sense to measure into it. Okay, cool. Okay, so an next component is system PCR FS. It's actually also the same C binary because it's also just, just a trivial thing. What it does basically, it can it's, it's an instantiated service and it's instantiated for any file system that you want, including the root file system, and it just measures the UUID of the root file system basically, and a couple of other uh, things that should not change between boots. So it also is measured into PCR15. Um, the yeah um, the the why do we measure both the the uh, like or all three of the machine ID the FS thing and the um, and the uh, uh, encryption key? That's simply because we want to be somewhat stable against uh, different definitions of what a machine is. Like some people might use uh, disk encryption, other people might not. Of course, you have much weaker um, uh, uh, protections if you don't do use disk encryption, but that still implies if we want to be generic and systemd has to be somewhat generic, then uh, we cannot all only rely on the disk encryption key as the identifier. And uh, similar for the other things, like some people use machine IDs that are transient or, or things like this, um, or use generations and uh, yeah, uh, so uh, ultimately, by measuring all three of these things, I think we can cover ground that there's always something there. And of course, if you don't bind it to the disk encryption key, it's kind of a weak thing, but that's on you, I would say. Yeah, so um, this allows, uh, PCR15 allows binding unlocking resources to the identity of the local system. Next thing I want to talk about is system stub. I talked about this a lot in the, in the UKI talk, so I'm going to... Um, go briefly over this. Yeah, it can do TPM2 measurements of the components of the UKI for you. Um, if you combine it like this, then that's what we call a UKI. Um, it measures primarily into PCR11, the components of the PCR, um, and measures a uh, kernel command line that you pass um, that, uh, like in SecuBoot, it will actually refuse um, taking a kernel command line from you under the assumption that the one that's actually uh, baked into the UKI is the one that matters. But in, if you turn off SecuBoot, it actually changes the logic so that it allows you to configure whatever you want on the kernel command line. And in that case, we'll measure it to PCR, uh, PCR 12 so that there's always uh, later security can still, like you can do remote attestation or lock secrets to a specific um, uh, kernel command line. And if you change it, then you lose access and things like that. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, um, to summarize again what kind of measurements we do, PCR11 is the UKI and the boot phases. Um, uh, PCR15 is system identity, is PCR12 is the kernel command line. Actually, there's more than that. this what we do, but I don't want to get lost into too many details. Um, I already mentioned this in a UKI talk briefly. Um, there's a system measure which generates the signatures for uh, the PCR values um, so that you can r protect disk encryption um, against a, a public key instead of literal values. Um, so it pre-calculates PCR11 measurements basically before boot, taking uh, the U UKI component as input. Um, and it signs the result, and then you can use it in system secret setup. It's supposed to be easy to use, meaning that if you have UKI, um, that uses this, like building a UKI like this is very easy because you just use UKI phi, which just wraps system you measure. Um, but once you build it and then you boot it up, then uh, the, the signature and the public key um, is just there. And then uh, system decrypt and roll and uh, system repart and whatever can format your disk. Um, we'll just take this into consideration given it's there and use it for the policy so you don't actually have to do anything anymore. So the idea basically is like if you decide to uh, accept um, UKIs as your savior, then all the other stuff comes basically for free. Um, yeah, I also mentioned the other talk, UK5, which makes it easy to build these UKIs um, and uh, assign them and yeah, combine them. Uh, next thing, system credentials. I this is getting uh, yeah. Let's do it like this. So, um, next thing, system credentials. I mentioned this a couple of times. Like it's it's how you can. Uh, 
pass uh, little bits of information into the system and then propagate them from the system into services and you can also pass them from a hypervisor like from outside of the hypervisor into the hypervisor to the system and then for also through container managers and always propagate down the tree basically and these Christian credentials can be locked to TPM um, so that it basically can say yeah I put my um, uh, private key on the system and I lock it to the TPM and then I know that when the service that needs it needs it it gets it but uh, um, uh, if somebody takes it off the machine and somewhere else they lose any chance to decode it um, yeah it's, it's for secret certificates cryptographic keys um, uh, um, passwords whatever you have um, um, could also be used for configuration. We use it for configuration, but it's uh, the yeah. The key really is that it's it's not world readable. It's it's uh, authenticated if you want and uh, and encrypted. Um, there are multiple ways how you can pass your system to credentials in there, like into a system, for example, via SM BIOS Type 11 objects. Not, not sure you heard about that. SM BIOS is this thing that like has been implemented on PCs for ages. Um, it describes what kind of hardware and, and firmware. Uh, the system has, but it has this type 11 thing, which basically is vendor strings, and a um, couple of the of the uh, virtualizers like QEMU and cloud, um, how's it called? Hypervisor. Cloud hypervisor support this, that you can set this easily on the command line, and it basically allows you to give to the M um, in an extremely efficient way um, credentials or any other form of string actually, um, and then uh, the VMs can actually pick this up. It's uh, how we actually suggest that uh, all these kind of uh, provisioning of systems should work. And uh, um, I want to. I think that cloud uh, um, in it. No, how's it yeah, that's how they're called. And ignition of these things should not exist, but this should be the way because it's blazingly fast and and doesn't require networking and things like that. So um, yeah, we advertise that as the way. Of course, the big clouds don't support that, but uh, we're working on convincing them otherwise. Anyway, so uh, credentials can be supplied via SM BIOS, uh, via some QEMU EMU specific thing, via a kernel command line, via EFI system partition. This is basically required to securely uh, uh, configure boot and things like that. Through a directory at secret store, and yeah, and they're always inherited from there, uh, from the system into services um, based on. Yeah, you can list basically the the, the every of the, one of these credentials has a name, and then you can list on a service which ones you want to uh, um, import from the system into the service. Then you have wildcards and a couple of other things so that you can do this generically. And yeah, they they may be encrypted and authenticated with a symmetric key in the TPM. Uh, policies are PCRs and signed PCRs, but no PIN because um, these things are supposed to be uh, um, non-interactive, right? Like um, the idea of credentials that they are unlocked the moment the service that consumes them starts, not earlier and not later. Um, and service um, activation, of course, is something that's supposed to be non-interactive um, because that happens all the time. Um, there's a tool called System Decreds which you can use to. Um, to uh, prepare these credentials, like to encrypt them um, and um, add authentication to them. Um, and then you have this binary blob that you can use wherever you want. Um, if you want to look into the details how this works, there's set credential, load credential, set credential encrypted, load credential encrypted, and import credential. The latter is probably the one you actually want to use um, uh, to configure on services. Look at the man pages for further details. Um, yeah, uh, the use case again is secure parameterization of systems and services, replacement for cloud in it and clouds, um, probably, but except for the case that none of the big clouds support this. Um, but uh, yeah, um, OS installers can parameterize UK UKIs locally with this. Um, yeah, I mean, this is in particularly relevant for the big dis commercial distributions, like let's say RHEL or something, because they typically run these installations where it's not under vendor control um, how they're parameterized, but under the the admin who installed the system or something like this. And this opens the doors of, of doing this. Next thing I want to talk about is system repo. And by the way, still, if you, anyone has any questions, totally interrupt me. Still, no one has questions. There's a question. So on, on in VMs, you, you mentioned uh, some BIOS 11 and um, QEMU. Uh, yeah, um, but on hardware, basically, your only option is then VFAT, uh, EFI partition? Is that? Yeah, OK. I mean, you know, if you have access to the file system, you can just put it in Etsy Cred Store, of course. But um, if you basically want to provision a system uh, um, offline without, um, uh, yeah, already setting up an encrypted disk or anything like this, um, I would, that's, that's certainly a way to go. Mm -hmm. 
um, sysup date for delivering credentials? We do not. Should we? Maybe. Yeah. I'm not volunteering. <laughs> So the next talk, uh, thing I would like to talk about is system repart. Sounds a little bit out of topic um, if you think about this first because system repart is a dynamic, dynamic repartitioner um, of the system that is supposed to run on first boot, actually it was supposed to run on every boot and uh, uh, um, extend the partition table or grow partitions um, uh, as necessary. So the original use case was, uh, um, yeah, uh, on the cloud everybody ships like a tiny minimalized image and then on first boot it just expands and, and adds a couple of other partitions. So why do I put this on a slide in the DPM talk? That's because it actually can, uh, like, one of the primary use cases for this is that uh, on first boot, it actually creates a root file system, encrypts it, and links it against the TPM. So that basically, the idea is basically that you then ship a, a OS disk image which has um, the slash user file system with the OS inside of it and uses DM variety and is immutable and nicely protected. And then you boot it up for the first time, and this is when the root file system is added in. The slash user uh, um, uh, partition is mounted into that. Um, and the uh, encryption key for that root file system is inherently local to the system. It's generated on the, on the system. It never leaves the system, and it's locked against the TPM um, on that local system. Um, it is, quite frankly, how I think this just should work, right? Like, it's... it's, it's uh, I mean, there are other approaches thinkable. I know, for example, like um, at my former employer, they were big on re-encryption, right? Like so that you shipped an encrypted disk and then on the first uh, boot it would change the key. And I think it's a terrible idea because you waste a lot of resources with every I.O., like every sector and things like that. Anyway, a system repart is definitely something you should keep in mind if you build TPM-based systems because something like this, this you probably do need in, in one form or another. And it's supposed to just work, right? Like basically that if you say encrypt equals TPM and a repart partition definition file, then and it sees that that partition doesn't exist yet, it will create it, format it um, with uh, uh, locks, um, enroll it to the DPM, and con you continue booting. Um, yeah, system repart is declarative, non-destructive, automatic partition tool. Um, uh, it can create root or slash var partitions on first boot um, and grow them too. And these partitions can be locked against uh, um, a locally generated volume key. Um, yeah, well, that's basically what I just said. Um, next thing, like there's a question. <clears throat> Do I understand you correctly that the system is encrypted at the first boot when the root file system is created? Yeah, that's... So that's the idea, yeah. Okay, so the system automatically also creates um, a passphrase to encrypt the disk. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the idea, yeah. It okay. creates a, a, a volume key um, randomly that never leaves the system and then enrolls the disk with that. And okay. Locks the key to the TPM. Um, but what happens, for example, when a user wants to install a custom kernel and now wants to boot the system, the TPM isn't unlocked because it isn't the kernel that was signed? And now he wants to unlock his disk, but the encryption key was created automatically. How could he do that? Um, I mean, you can, like, if you manage to unlock the disk, you manage to unlock the disk, right? So you certainly have access to the volume key then. And Linux in the kernel will always keep the volume key around for you because it needs it for decryption and encryption of the individual sectors. So what you could always do, if you want to change the policy um, that you lock the disk to, you can always enroll the TPM again with different parameters. Um, Lux has this model that you have slots, and then you can basically enroll a FIDO2 device, um, another FIDO2 device, three TPMs, uh, five passwords, and seven PKCS11 PKCS um, uh, smart cards or whatever you want. So basically, yeah. Um, system decrypt enroll even allows you to do this to some degree at least. But don't you need to input the current password before you are allowed to add a new uh, credential in Lux? Well, yes, but I mean, uh, if you manage to unlock it once, you can still unlock it, right? Like, if you ever manage to boot, like, of course, I mean, if you cannot unlock the, the disk at all, right? Sorry. <laughs> then you're off, off, yeah. But if you manage to boot up with it, then the Linux kernel got the key. And if you didn't make use of the phase feature, right, like which basically locks unlocking of TPM to a certain part of the boot, if you didn't use it, then you can also during normal runtime unlock it in the same way if the, because the PCRs will still match. 
So, uh, but yeah, of course, I mean, the, the, if you use the PCR phase thing and you say never unlock this afterwards, then of course you're fucked. Like, uh, because there's only this tiny window at boot uh, where you can get the key. And uh, if the kernel then has it, never gives it back to you. Um, you can't get it from the TPI anymore. But this is up to you with what kind of policy you choose for this kind of lockdown. Uh, do you also support DM integrity in addition to DM crypts, so for authenticated encryption? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, do we? <laughs> no, uh, like, especially I mean, for, for data partitions like VAR, it would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, in, in theory, of course, everybody should use um, encryption and authentication uh, for things like that. Uh, we certainly support it for, like, I mean, the libcrypt setup supports it. I'm not sure if we hooked that through ever, but... Um, we have DM systemd integrity setup. We sure, but I mean, we don't but support... It's not, it's not integrating into this stuff, though. Yeah, I don't think I, I so. I don't think system repair has the option for that, but adding that would be trivial, right? Like, um, we should just do it. So thanks for volunteering. Uh, to implement. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? He likes questions. Ask questions. No? So um, something uh, that I very recently added, which is in the Git main, but it's not in, uh, in, uh, in a release version yet, is that we actually maintain a TPM measurement log. So... Uh, um, if you do measurements, it's kind of important that you also keep a log about what you measured so that you can argue about it afterwards and you can uh, figure out what actually happened that you came to the point where you came to. Um, the firmware maintains one measurement log that covers all the measurements happen that, that happen basically until the West takes over. Uh, it's available on Linux and slash, slash this somewhere and you can parse it and, and then decide, okay, what, what's happening there and uh, um, then argue about what happened and everything's in order. It's actually a crucial part of uh, deriving policy from, uh, from an existing system um, that you don't know, um, uh, where you don't know ahead of time the firmware measurements that would take place. We nowadays do all these measurements in user space too. Like for example, measure the, the, the root encryption, like the encryption key of the root file system and these phases and things like that. Uh, previously, we never actually logged about that. So it made it very hard to argue about it, to do remote attestation, to figure out if everything's in order. Uh, I recently added this, that this is uh, uh, like improved. Um, this, like, I mean, we did log it to the journal um, we did log it to the journal, um, meaning to syslog kind of stuff, but that's kind of shitty because that's subject to rotation, of course. And if you want to like, come back like um, uh, one week later and argue about um, PCR measurements, it kind of sucks if the beginning of your measurement log is gone because then it's, everything's invalidated. So that's why it needs to be separate from the journal. It needs to, it can only grow. It can never be rotated away unless you, you're fine with losing uh, um, uh, uh, the ability to argue about it. Um, so this stuff is actually a format, it's, it's a JSON file basically. Um, it's actually JSON SEC, like JSON SEQ. Um, it's a sequence of JSON objects. Um, it's very close to the TCG CL JSON format. CL is the common event log format. Um, it's not exactly that uh, for reasons. Um, I wanted to use that but um, the, the CL is, you know, it, it requires that uh, um, the logs, like first of all, they have to have record numbers, right? Like they always have to start at one and things like that. And I think that's a stupid idea. Like first of all, it's redundant because you can just go to the, through the measurements and uh, you don't need this information and it's unprotected because it's not included in the hash. And because, I mean, to get the full list of measurements, you always need to include the, the, the measurements that the SM, like the, the, sorry, that the firmware did. Um, and hence, uh, yeah, if you maintain a log in user space and then add, add record numbers to it, what's this good for? Because it's going to, like, what you label as one might actually be the 55th uh, measurement in the whole system. So anyway, I left that part out. And the other thing that I didn't do is uh, the, the TCG specification says it needs to be in a JSON array. And I think that's stupid because it basically means that the log file wouldn't be append only anymore because you basically have to load the whole array into memory, the append one thing and write it back again, which is just shitty if it's supposed to grow. So I just opted for uh, JSON SEQ, which is another RFC where basically you just add one JSON object, another JSON object, and you put a separator in between, which is like the ASCII code 17 or something, that record separator ASCII, and a zero, like a null at the end, and then uh, 
um, yeah. But it's trivial to convert it to the full spec, right? Like you just like and and JQ and these tools they all support this this uh, thing anyway. So it's trivial to convert. You just load all the objects and wrap them in an array and you add the record numbers. There you go. They then they have the full thing. It's on purpose TC, TCGCL so that other people can consume it, right? Like so, um, if you now take the logs that the firmware does, our logs, and then the IMA logs, then you basically have ev all the measurements that happen on the system. Um, I think there's a, there's a talk right after mine talking about the universal event log stuff. So yeah, let's not talk for that anymore. Um, okay, uh, um, I think I got less than ten minutes left. Um, any questions at this point in time? Five minutes. Um, otherwise, I'll talk a little bit about the shortcomings of the design because this is far from complete. Like uh, one of the major things security holds in this uh, system is that uh, we measure all kind of stuff to PCR 11, 12, 15, um, but um, there is no anchor to it, right? Like we assume that it's zero, and that's what we rely on. But um, because shim or no earlier boot uh, thing measures anything about the chosen boot path into these PCRs, what people could do is they get their stuff signed by the by some shim key, um, uh, then measure whatever they like in there, and not actually boot that, but boot something completely different, and they will get to the same PCR values and fuck with us. Um, solution one could be that shim, like this is a proposal, right, um, would measure um, into all these other OS PCRs basically, um, some string identifying what they're actually going to boot, right? Like so, on like if it's a Fedora installation, they should just measure the string Fedora on, into it. That would have the effect, and if this is required by the shim signing process, that would already be enough to just make sure that yeah, um, if a different OS um, will measure a different thing, uh, then it uh, um, wouldn't work anymore. Um, solution number two is something called system PCR lock. Um, that I could probably do a talk about as, uh, of its own. Um, let's talk about shortcomings number two. Asymmetric unlocking, this is something I want um, right now. If you enroll your disk against TPM, it's symmetric. You can only enroll it on the local thing. With some exceptions, we have um, uh, something there now. Um, uh, sometimes for certain use cases, it might be interesting to enroll a disk or a credential um, Offline, like, like you do it on one system, and then the only that right system can unlock it. We are like we have some support for something like this in some scenarios, like confidential computing, but it's not there where I want it to to be. Uh, there's no rollback protection, uh, meaning that if you have a, a, a UKI that is probably signed with PCRs and things like that, and you have one from uh, uh, five years earlier where the kernel was vulnerable, both of them will get access to all secrets. There's no way how to invalidate the old kernels so far. Solution to that is also this component that I'm going to, probably not going to talk about that much anymore because I don't have that much time. Uh, but it's uh, something coming up to systemd very soon that uh, will solve, solve this. Um, biggest thing ever like this, no way to lock against zero, like the other PCRs that basically lock down the firmware. Solution to that is also the system PCR lock. Next thing is, I don't know, or actually I have a rough idea now what KXEC means with all of this, right? Like KXEC is a thing where you replace one OS with the next one and pass control over to it. What does it actually mean for a TPM? Do you measure things new? I think I have a solution with it. Oh, it's again system PCR lock. So let's very briefly, I got like a minute or something, two minutes about system PCR lock. Uh, it's halfway to there. I mean, there's a branch and you can play around with it, but it's not uh, ready yet. It's uh, not even Git main or anything. Um, but this is the next thing that uh, I uh, um, uh, like. I have been working on for the last weeks, and it's, I'm very close to having something uh, uh, ready for that. It's basically, I mean, some distributions like Ubuntu people, for example, have implemented something similar. But I think my solution is way more generic, and it's what pro people ultimately should use. What this does basically, it creates a, uh, a uh, uh, an access policy based on PCRs and tries to uh, predict the PCRs uh, based on what components you have installed in the system. Really short summary is that all the components that are um, involved in boot are support, supposed to drop in a file describing the measurements that are probably going to be made if that thing is booted, a so-called PCR log file, .pcr log, and they drop it in one directory, and they can drop in multiple alternative versions in case they want to support alternative versions of that component, like for example, multiple versions of the kernel UKI, or multiple versions of the bootloader, multiple versions of shim, whatever you have in the boot process. Um, and then system PCR 
Mr. Arlock will look at this, will compare it with the measurements that actually happened on the system on the current boot, and if it recognizes everything, then we'll synthesize a uh, access policy from that stores that in a NV index, which is something you can do in TPM2 that not many people know, and then you can lock your disk encryption to that. Meaning basically that, uh, um, yeah, and you can also generate these PCR log files directly from the log if you want to, to cover for firmwares uh, where you do not know what kind of measurements they will make. Hopefully, though, eventually these PCR log files, um, which by the way are just CL JSON files, um, because uh, you can just reuse the format there because that's simply what measurements, like it just encodes what measurements happen. Uh, my long-term goal, of course, is that I want this eventually to um, to be shipped with um, like the, what, what's it called, LF, uh, LVFS stuff, like the, the Linux for, like so FW update, you basically can um, provide us with that information at the same time as a BIOS update, like a, as a firmware update um, happens, that nice vendors give us the, the measurements that are likely going to happen if that um, a boot happens. So anyway, uh, this is the summary. You all read it now. My time's over. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's good that I didn't spend too much time on this because it's a uh, talk of the future. and. Um, if you want to know more about that, uh, you can look at the slides or you can look at the PR that is, uh, like I, I've posted already, mostly to get CI testing and things like that. I'm just still shifting a couple of things around um, uh, there. But uh, the ultimate goal of this, of course, is that I, we can do the same thing that Windows does um, and lock against the firmware but still have um, a strategy what to do um, on expected uh, uh, firmware upgrades. Um, in the nice case, um, when we know the measurements that will ha happen and probably in the common case um, where we will do not, not know that and have to find out ourselves on the next boot what actually changed so that we can subsequently lock it down again. Um, anyway, uh, maybe we, we have a question. We can take a couple of questions if there are questions. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm just wondering uh, exactly what your idea is. Say you have a system set up with uh, full disk encryption locked to the PCRs and locked to the specific uh, UKR that's booted, right? Uh, how, do you, how do you actually update this UKI? Say a new kernel comes out, how do you securely verify this is a kernel update that I want while still preventing uh, say some bad actor injecting its own malicious code into signing. Like, how do we protect the signing key from you everyone don't, else? You don't actually have to do anything special. You just take the UKI that is packaged in the RPM and drop it in the ESP. Because uh, um, uh, if the system then boots with that, um, uh, it will come with the signature for the PCRs um, that are expected, and the signature will be done by the vendor um, and only the vendor can do these signatures. So basically, uh, you don't have to do anything special. It's just that the, that the vendor has to prepare the kernels and include the right signatures so that it can still unlock your data. Okay, but say you roll your own keys. Then Sorry? If you roll your own keys, right? So if you do your own keys, then you have to sign locally. We have infrastructure for that. I mentioned that in the other talk, this Yuki, Yukify kernel install script that can run basically whenever you um, install a raw kernel, like not a UKI kernel, but like an, an unsigned kernel, and then you can sign it automatically on install with your own private key. But then, yeah, sure, you have to make sure that you uh, uh, retain access to that key and you use the same key for every, every signing um, because that is what give, will give you back access to your own disk. Yeah, my question is whether you store this key. That's up to you. You can store that in a, in a, a, on disk if you like. Uh, there's currently no support for something like OpenSSL3 engines or something. But if we had that, and I think Luca volunteered to do this, then you can store that key on your, I don't know, PKCS11, HSM, YubiKey, whatever thingy. Um, that's entirely up yeah, to so you. Key then. management is out of scope. Use one of these for the key. And then <coughs> yes, let's uh, all thank Leonard for his talk. Thank you.